Well, good evening. Are y'all excited to be here tonight? How many of you have got a good Nazarene nap today? Caught a few, caught a few winks. That's good. That is good. I was encouraged. I was. Uh, we went to lunch, and I came back up here so I could meet with our Hispanic group. And man, they had a full house for Sunday school this morning. It had a great crowd. I'm always encouraged by that. And. Um, it was just fun this afternoon and uh, going over stuff for tonight and just thankful for the opportunities that we have to be together. It's great to see Daryl and Sherry. We're glad you're here, you know. Man, we're just glad you're here and we, uh, yeah, you're welcome just to come back. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'll slide right on out and you just slide right on in, man. <laughs> Hotel de Shite. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Good deal. Well, we're glad you got to take a little break, and I know how important those are. They never come close enough together. You know, if we could preach a week, break a week, preach a week, break, you know, it'd be a great life. But um, I don't know. What are we complaining about, though? We only work one day a week, right? That's what I'm hearing anyway. That's what they're telling me. That's what I heard about. You you snuck in and did did Daryl wear a skirt that night or kind of? <laughs> it was a kilt. She said it was a kilt. There we go. It was a kilt. That's good. Well, hey, we're glad to see you guys and glad you're here and thankful for all that the Lord's been doing in you and through you and with you and um, just some exciting things, it sounds like, uh, out in the great metropolis of Larned. So, well, hey, we're going to sing a little tonight and take a look at the Word and, and just spend some good time together. Why don't we start with a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to lift some songs to the Lord. Father, how good it is on this Sunday night just to be able to pause in the midst of getting ready for the next week. And just take a few moments to worship you. May the music, may the words, may the time in prayer, may the message, may everything that happens tonight be something you use to lift our spirits, to encourage our hearts, and to give us strength for the journey. And Lord, we're going to give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's start with He is so precious to me. So precious is Jesus, my Savior, my King. His praise all the day long with rapture I sing. To Him in my weakness for strength I can cling. For He is so special to me. For He is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me, tis heaven below, my Redeemer to know. For he is so precious to me, I stand on the mountain of blessing at last. No cloud in the heavens, a shadow to cast. His smile is upon me, the valley is past. For he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Tis heaven below my Redeemer to know. For he is so precious to me. I praise him because he appointed a place where someday through faith in his wonderful grace I know I shall see him, shall look on his face. 
for he is so precious to me for he is so precious to me for he is so precious to me tis heaven below my redeemer to know for he is so precious to me in that second verse that we sang there's a phrase that says his smile is upon me the valley is past have you ever noticed every picture that any artist has ever rendered of jesus there's never a smile on his face have you ever noticed that it's not a stern look it's just kind of a, a look and I remember back in, um, I think it was about 1978 or 9, um, Dr. Robert Schuler commissioned a statue of the smiling Jesus that was put in the gardens at the Crystal Cathedral. And it became one of the most... Uh, visited attractions at the cathedral uh, during the next about eight or ten years. And, and, and I remember when they dedicated it, I, uh, my grandmother was a, a, an incredible fan of Dr. Schuler, and uh, she loved to watch it, and she said, you have to watch the replay of this. And so I did. And it was so neat to hear him talk about the smiling Jesus. And he said, you know, that's something we don't think about. But I read those words in there, his smile is upon me, the valley is past. Man, I love that thought. And tonight I believe the Lord is smiling, amen? He looks upon us and he sees, I don't think it's his stern look where he's thinking, you know, what's so wrong with you and, and, and a grumpy look where he's wondering if we're ever going to get it. I think he looks upon those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and he says, man, I'm just so blessed by you. Isn't that a neat thought that he could be blessed by us? The fact that we have responded to the overtures of his grace and his love. And tonight, if you take nothing else away from the service, take this away with you. Jesus is smiling on you. Amen? Well, hey, let's try another song, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, safe to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. 
Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even be, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defied. By its transforming power, making him God's dear child. Purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Boy, when they're high like that, it hurts. <laughs> Let's pray a word together. God, you are so good, and I just thank you today for your presence and your peace among us. Uh, Lord, today I was reading a number of passages where uh, the Apostle Paul was, was writing greetings to churches, and I kept coming across that incredible line, grace and peace to you. Lord, tonight, I, I don't even know where to begin when I think of those words. The grace that you've extended and the peace that it produces is absolutely unbelievable. And we're blessed tonight to be recipients of it. Lord, in this room and online, there are folks who have worshipped you, who have lived for you, who accepted you as their Lord and Savior long, long ago. Uh, down through the years, they have found you faithful. Your grace and your peace have been constant companions. Uh, some, Lord, have found faith in a, a much nearer time than others. And for them, Lord, that grace and peace has a, a fresher, newer meaning because it's, it is so fresh. And God, I just thank you for it. Tonight, I just pray that that grace and peace that came to us when we first came to you, that journeys with us, Lord, as we follow you faithfully, that is our constant companion when we walk with the Lord. May that grace and peace be tonight what we sense in this place, in this moment, as we worship you. Father, all of us have needs tonight, and we just plead your grace and seek your peace in knowing, God, that in your hands all of those things will be well. That we can trust them to you and believe, God, that you have an answer, you have a solution, you have a fix for everything that is for us a concern. And we just pray tonight, God, that you would be in the midst of all of them. Thanks, Lord, for each who's here. May you bless each, each heart and each home. And be especially tonight, Lord, with Daryl and Sherry. God, it is so good to have them back with us. Lord, we understand uh, the journey of ministry. And I know, Lord, how there are times you just feel absolutely wrung out. And God, I'm thankful that this weekend they've been able to break away and come back and catch a breath of fresh air and have the opportunity to let some folks love on them and just... Uh, rest, Lord. I pray your blessings over them. I pray, God, that your hand would be upon them and that your love would be poured out in them and through them. And that as they head back tomorrow home, that, God, you would go before them. 
and whatever things they left when they came this week here uh, wouldn't be such a burden when they get back. Whatever issues they were having to deal with wouldn't be such big issues when they return. May in all of those things they find your grace and your peace. And Lord, we're going to trust you to give them what they need to press through. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when you yell as loud as I yelled last night at a football game, it makes it really hard to sing or preach. My voice is gone. And it would just so happen that on such a night, John would pick the Nazarene National Anthem. Do you know what the Nazarene National Anthem is? Does anybody know what that is? You've got it. Stan's been around the church long enough to know the Nazarene National Anthem. My wife would say this, you have to stand to sing it. But you don't have to because she's not here. <laughs> Let's lift it to the Lord. Called unto holiness, church of our God, purchase of Jesus, redeemed by his blood, called from the world and its idols to flee, called from the bondage of sin to be free. Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we're marching along. Sing it, shout it loud and long. Holiness unto the Lord now and forever. Called unto holiness, children of light, walking with Jesus in garments of white, raiment unsullied nor tarnished with sin, God's Holy Spirit abiding within. Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we're marching along. Sing it, shout it, loud and long. Holiness unto the Lord now and forever. Called unto holiness, praise his dear name. This blessed secret to faith now made plain. Not our unrighteousness, but Christ within. Living and reigning and saving from sin. Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we're marching along. Sing it, shout it loud and long. Holiness unto the Lord now and forever. Called unto holiness, bride of the Lamb. Waiting the bridegroom's returning again. Lift up your heads for the day draweth near. When in his beauty the king shall appear. Holiness unto the Lord as were much word and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we're marching along. Sing it, shout it loud and long. Holiness unto the Lord now and forever. And let's close out tonight with glorious freedom. Once I was bound by sin's galling fetters, chained like a slave, I struggled in vain. But I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my fetters in twain. 
Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of sin I repine. Jesus the glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be mine. Freedom from all the carnal affections, freedom from every hatred and strife, freedom from pain and worldly ambitions, freedom from all that sadden my life. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of pine. Jesus the glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be mine. Freedom from fear with all of its torments, freedom from care with all of its pain, freedom in Christ, my blessed Redeemer, he who has rent my fetters in twain. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of sin I repine. Jesus the glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be mine. Amen. Well, we're going to start a new study tonight, and what I'm going to try to do over uh, the next three or four years is uh, preach my way through First and Second Thessalonians. Some of you know what I mean by that. We get into Bible studies on Wednesday night that I'm hoping won't take too long, and they wind up taking forever. And um, so we're going to try tonight to uh, get a jump on what is an incredibly wonderful couple of books uh, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. And, and hopefully, as we work through these words, we'll uh, learn something that we can use and something that can help us um, in our journey with the Lord. I, um, I've been working through a lot of things in my own life in recent days, uh, trying to understand some of the, uh, the things that God is doing in my heart and, and, and the, the leadings, the guiding that he's giving me and trying to help me to become all that he wants me to be. Uh, one of the things that has just been part of my journey is trying to understand what it means when God calls us to be a people of faith. I um, often struggle with the simple answers that we give to things. And when it comes to this whole journey of faith and the understanding of, of what God is calling us to as we seek to follow after him and walk with him, the one thing that I'm, I'm realizing more and more every day is how much he really was serious when he said to us that he wanted us to be like him. When a disciple is fully taught, he will be like his teacher. The Apostle Paul had been on a journey. He had been working 
in, in the region of Philippi, and, and, and as he was working and preaching there, he had aggravated a group of people in the community, and they had taken him captive and beat him sorely and thrown him into a jail. And you'll remember the story of how God emancipated him from that jail, set him free in the night. Uh, Paul immediately began a journey. And he moved first to the community of Berea, and there he preached the gospel. And it wasn't long after winding up in Berea that those same hooligans that had been after him, that's a terrible thing to call religious folk, but, but that just kind of fits, you know. Those same hooligans that had been after him in Philippi had fallen into Berea and and they had run him out there. And he had then gone to Athens and he had preached in Athens with really mixed reviews. There really wasn't a lot of positive things you could say about what happened there. But, but leaving Athens, he moves on to the community of, of Corinth. And, and once he gets to Corinth, he really begins to struggle. He's discouraged. He's depressed. He's having a midlife ministry crisis. He's in the midst of his second missionary journey and he's wondering, have I done anything that anyone could consider had worth? Have the message I've preached had value? Have the places I've shared been changed? Have the lives I've confronted really come to new life in Christ? And one day there in the midst of all of that in Corinth, Silas and Timothy show up. They say, Paul, we'd, we'd like to share with you some information about where you've been. God's doing some amazing things, Paul, in Thessalonica. He's working. The church is flourishing. The spirit is moving. Lives are being changed. Good things are happening. Paul, you need to be encouraged. And it's interesting, the first thing Paul did hearing those words was to sit down and write a letter to the church at Thessalonica. Most historians would say this letter to the church at Thessalonica was the first of all the letters that Paul would write to churches. And in it, he shared some incredible things about life and ministry and and, and the way God was at work in people's hearts. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan said of this letter that it's full of interest because it's certainly among the first of those which have been preserved for us from the pen of Paul. And it was the first that he ever wrote to European churches. And in it, the fundamental things of the Christian faith, the Christian life, are clearly set forth. I like to read First and Second Thessalonians. They encourage me. They lift my spirits. They teach me much, actually. They're filled with Christian thought and dogma and theology. They're also filled with Christian experience. And I guess that's what makes them so incredibly important. In the first chapter... Paul begins this letter with one of those greetings to the church at the 
at Thessalonica and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to all of you. I just love that. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. God's unmerited favor and this incredible deep sense of settledness that it produces. Grace and peace. And what is he, he does then in the next seven or eight verses is, is share a word of thanksgiving for the faith that Timothy and Silas have shared they saw while visiting there. L- listen to these words. And then tonight for just a few moments, we're gonna draw a few thoughts out of them. He says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Let me stop there. Do you remember back in grade school when we used to pick teams? Did y'all do that back in grade school? How many of you were the first one picked? Yeah, that's what I thought. Most of us fell down the list a little bit. I I remember the coaches would come out with the baseball bat and you know, they'd throw it up in the air and you'd catch it and you'd go hand over hand over hand until you got to the top and whoever got to the top made the first choice and, and, and then you'd all sit there and you'd wonder, will they pick me? Will they pick me? Uh, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a commercial on TV now, and I don't know what it's advertising, but, but it's a bunch of kids on a basketball court, and one of the kids picks Charles Barkley. And he kind of just, yeah, God, I told you I'd get picked first and all this stuff. And, and it was just kind of cool. But you know, we all love to be chosen. I remember as I went through school, there came a time when I was usually one of those guys who was picking teams and and I always felt bad for the people that didn't get picked. And so I, I kind of made a decision along with one of my buddies who was the other captain and I said, let's pick the losers first. <laughs> it's a terrible way to talk about people. But Jimmy, Brandon, and I, we, we got up there and I want this one. And everybody kind of went, what? And Jim goes, I want this one. And everybody kind of goes, what? You know, and, and, and we didn't pick the stars. We picked the spastics, you know, the guys that just, they, they'd fall over their shoelaces, even if they were tied. And, and, and it was just kind of one of those things. But man, you'd have thought that we'd given them a million dollars because they were chosen. And something happens when Paul writes to the church and he says, we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God. That's where it starts. Oh my goodness, I am worthy of being loved by God. And not only loved, but chosen. Wow. Why? Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how he lived among you for your sake. Paul's talking about the testimony of his life, what he did while he was there, trying to reflect Jesus to them every single day. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Life was not easy in Thessalonica. There, were lot, there was lots of turmoil and trouble and, and, and tribulation and it was just not an easy place. But when they heard the message of Paul and they saw that he was willing to endure, they said, you know, if he can do it, we'll do it. And they did it. Paul says, man, God noticed, and so did I. In verse 7, so you became a model to all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out for you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. 
Now, folks, I don't know where everywhere is, but it's everywhere. Think about that. Paul's writing a letter and, and, and he's just gotten a report and he's saying, man, you are all stars. You are shining. Everybody knows your name. You're out there on the marquees and in the front big lights because you have lived so faithfully and well for Christ that the world's taken notice. Therefore, We don't really need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. The world says of these believers, man, they showed kindness and compassion and care for Paul and those preachers from Judea. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, now I don't know what you heard there but I would tell you that if I got a letter with a, a, a glowing praise of my life like that, I'd kind of be like, you know, Fred Sanford and say, I'm moving on up, you know? I'm just moving on up. And what Paul's tried to do in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is to communicate to a group of new believers that I've noticed and God's noticed and the world has noticed the difference you are making. I really want you to hear that tonight. I really want you to hear that. In a world where we might wonder, <clears throat> do I really make a difference? Does my faith really accomplish anything. I want you to know you've made a difference. A month ago, we were at Fun After 50 and um, Ira was with us that night and and Landa, or Andrew, and it was just a fun night. I was a hugger. And he went to everybody at every table, and he gave them hugs, and he loved on them, and he just made you feel real special. And, and I, I picked him up on Friday. Uh, I always go and pick him up because Andrew's usually working, and he comes to our house and he has dinner and then Andrew comes and gets him and they have an incredible weekend together. But, but Friday night, I picked him up and got to the house and he looks out and he sees Hank. And he goes, Papa, man, man. And he's smiling and, and he wants to take off running. Hank's kind of like backing out of the driveway in his truck and it's like he'll squash you as flat as a bug on a rug kid come here but here's a little guy who's only met Hank once who in the warmth of an embrace remembered the difference somebody made in their lives you've made a difference and in those times in your life and in my life when we wonder, does anybody care? Has anybody noticed? Have we accomplished anything? Our world's a different place because you've been in it. This morning, one of my football players was here. His parents flew in from Philadelphia for the weekend and I got to meet him last night at the football game and introduced myself and they said, oh, 
you're Pastor John. It's like, oh, what is the, uh, what I do now, you know? And they said, we've heard about your church. Is it normal for your people to adopt absolute strangers as big as our kid? And I joked with him and I said, did we have a choice? We're scared of Goliath. (laughs) They said, you have loved our son and gave him a place to worship God. And we are so thankful. You've made a difference. That's That's what Paul's trying to say to the church, both then and now. And as he starts talking about all the things that they'd made a difference doing, there are a few things that I I want to single out tonight. Actually, there's four of them, and I'll move quick. The first one's found in chapter 1 and verse 3, where it says that the people were faithful in the work God had set before him to do. I love this. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Now, now I want you to notice what he says there because the way he organizes his words is absolutely critical to understanding the meaning. He says we remember your work produced by faith. He doesn't say, we remember your faithful work that in doing you produced faith that enabled you to believe. He doesn't say that their work produced faith. He says their work was produced by the faith they possessed. God had done a work in him. And they believed and put that faith into action through consecrated ministry. They were touching lives just as you touch lives. They were about the business of being Jesus in a lost and broken world. And God noticed. And Paul writes, I remember before God and our Father the work you've done that's been produced by the faith that is in you. God had done some amazing things. You see, if you look a little bit further down in the chapter, it says that they had turned from God to idols, or from to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That part of, of the world, if, if, if you kind of know the geography of the area, from Athens and, and Corinth to Thessalonica, that part of the world was consumed with the flesh. All you have to do is read the books of First and Second Corinthians, and you come to understand that, that the flesh was a big deal. It was part of the church. And in fact, if, if you go to Corinth and, and the ruins at Corinth, uh, you will find there the, the ruins of the temple of Diana and the fact that people went there to worship at the temple and the, the actions of worship was to participate in prostitution. That was worship. This was a corrupt place. They did human sacrifice. They sacrificed children. It it was a gross and 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 despicable thing. When I remember when Debbie and I were in Athens a number of years ago, everywhere you went, to this day, there are these ungodly statues that you can buy for your home of incredibly pornographic images. Times haven't changed, folks. It's sickening. And yet, Paul says, this work of faith was produced by God in you and through you as you separated yourself unto him. The closer we get to Jesus, the 
easier it is for us to be faithful in the work that God's called us to do. Second thought I see there, it's also in verse 3, when he says, they labored and served in love, not out of obligation, but out of a holy desire to touch lives and make a difference. He says, we remember before our God and Father, your labor prompted by love. This labor, this work, this service, is what happens as a result of God's love at work in us. Why do you care for people? Why do you embrace things like compassion and encouragement? Why do you give? Why do you share? Because we've all been recipients of God's love. And that love motivates us to serve him even as he ministered to us out of love. This is the place where in honor we put others before ourselves. I got to brag on you, our church. There are things that happen sometimes that you know absolutely nothing about. It's absolutely cool. A little over a week ago, we, we got a message to us on Messenger from someone in our community. It was from a transient, a, a war veteran who was struggling to figure out how to live life in this world and he had come to Salina with hopes and, 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 and dreams and every hope and dream that he had had literally been squashed in this community. He had sent notes to, to five different churches in the community, ours being the last. And out of five notes to the churches, our, our church was the only one that responded. John and I made an appointment with him to sit down and buy him breakfast and hear his story and see what his needs were and and try to help him along the way. And and we went and sat with him and he just kind of unburdened himself and poured out his heart and, and we just listened. We asked him what we could do to make life better now. And he says, well, I need to get to uh, South Dakota. I've talked to the VA there and I've, I've got some resources there and I have a job opportunity there and I, I just need to get there and I have $4 to my name. And we said, you know what? We, we, we'll get you a bus ticket. It's not a problem. We'll get you to South Dakota. And, and as we were getting ready to leave, I, I handed him whatever cash I had in my billfold and said, you got to eat, you know, and when you get everything lined up so you can go and you know that everything's the way it's supposed to be on the other end because we're not going to send you to go to a vacuum. We want to know that you have a, a job, a place to stay, all of those things so that you won't, don't wind up under some bridge somewhere. We called later in the week and he said, hey, the IRS has communicated with me and they have my, uh, my stimulus check where I used to work in Trinidad, Colorado. They're holding it for me. I don't need to go to South Dakota. I got to go to Trinidad first and then I'll use my stimulus check to get to South Dakota. Could I, I get a train ticket instead of a bus ticket? Crazy thing was it was the same price. Kind of shocked me. Well, we bought him a a bus ticket instead of, or a train ticket instead of a bus ticket. And Hank and Sherry drove him down to the train station in in, in Hutchinson. And I I gave him some money so that he'd have money for food and and a hotel when he gets to to, uh, Trinidad. And he was absolutely amazed that we would care for him. A nobody who has no connection to us. One of my conversations with him, I said, we, we really don't have a choice. His name was John. I said, John, we don't really have a choice. 
choice. And what do you mean you don't have a choice? I said, God's loved us and he expects us to share that love. So we're going to love you in the same measure that he's loved us. And so we're going to give you what you need to stay on the journey. And you know how that became possible? Because some of you in this room have a given over the years to something called care and share. A little fun where we set back money to, to buy food for people and to take care of things in the pantry and every once in a while reach out and bless somebody who needs help. They labored and served in love, not out of obligation, but out of a holy desire to touch lives and make a difference. And every time you give, Every time you serve, every time you share, you're making that kind of ministry possible for our church. Isn't that amazing? Paul celebrated the fact that the Thessalonians were a people whose labor was being noticed and was producing change in the world. In fact, he says, the Lord's message rang out from you. And I think it does from us as well. Little things. Sharon brought the idea of this blessing box to us from her sister down in Wichita. And, and, and there's like six of these blessing boxes in town and, and ours is out here on the corner. And uh, that blessing box gets filled and emptied at least six times a day. I count them. People will come in and they will pack that baby full of groceries. And as soon as that gets packed, people will come in and they'll take everything out. You know, and you would think people would be greedy. I mean, come on, there's free food here. But they'll grab a bag and they'll look and they'll take this and they'll take that and they'll take this and they'll step back and they'll close the doors and they'll go. Somebody else will come and they'll do the same thing and you know, it's kind of fun. We have some folks back here in the, the apartments back here that don't have a lot, and, and they'll occasionally walk out. And, you know, I'd have no problem if they just emptied the blooming thing. But they come out and they get enough for a meal. And they walk home knowing their needs are supplied. That's a labor of love. That's the message ringing out. I had somebody stop by this week and say, this box out here yours? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that box is ours. It actually belongs to the community. We just put it out there. And well, do you fill it all the time? And I said, well, we put stuff in it, but a lot of folks in the community fill it too. And it's just there for people to use. Well, that's a pretty good thing. I'm gonna go buy some groceries. And he did, and he came back in about an hour and put a bunch of stuff in it. Our our ladies who come here with the food truck during the week, uh, they were out there one day serving lunch, and somebody pulled up and said, hey, um, is that yours down there? And she goes, no, it's something the church has put out. It's a ministry of the church. And and, um, he goes, well, you know what? I, uh, I hate to go to the grocery store. And he pulls out his billfold and he hands them a $100 bill and says, would you just go buy $100 worth of groceries and put them in that thing for me? He's come back a couple times. And they just faithfully go to the store, buy groceries and fill it. And as soon as they fill it, it disappears. And it's an amazing thing. The message rang out from you. There's a third thing I want you to see tonight. And that is that these folks lived with endurance an endurance that's inspired only by the hope they found in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.3, we remember before our God and our Father your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus. Trials and tribulations were a major part of their journey. Tough times came. Paul celebrated the fact that they had learned to stand strong because their hope was not in their circumstances. Their hope was in the Lord. 
They lived with this, this hope of his coming, the hope of, of his love and his grace and his mercy being poured out throughout eternity. And, and, and that just motivated him to keep on keeping on. I love the way Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 8 and verse 24 when he says it's for this hope we're saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? These folks had hope in what they did not yet have, but knew with certainty it would one day come. And doesn't that describe us? I would love to tell you tonight that I could predict with certainty the moment lightning is going to shine out of the east, even under the west, and the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound, and 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 the dead are going to be raised, and and and, and, and those who are who are alive when their Christ comes will be caught up in the air with him. I would love to say it's going to happen at this time, at this moment, in this situation, and and when that happens, you better be ready to go up because if you don't, you're going down. I'd, I'd love to be able to do that, but you know what I can tell you. With hope we wait. The message of the angels in the book of Acts in the first chapter is still true for us when they look at the disciples then and now and they say, why do you stand gazing? This same Jesus whom you've seen go will come again. And and the reality is we don't know when or how or how long it's going to take. At some moment he's going to come. And these folks found hope that gave them endurance because they knew the promise of the Lord was true. There's a song that we sing every once in a while whose chorus begins, it will be worth it all. I had an older gentleman in my last church that Love that song. We'd sing it every once in a while and he'd come up to me after service and he'd say, his health was really bad. and He'd say, Pastor John, my life sucks. It's terrible. I wouldn't wish what I deal with on anybody. But it will be worth it all when we see Christ. Wow. Paul celebrated the fact that they had active faith, laborious love. I like that term, laborious love, and patient hope. But what kept them going? Let's close tonight looking at verses 9 and 10. There we read, they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. These folks celebrated life with anticipation mingled with expectation as they awaited the return of the Lord. Anticipation mingled with expectation. They knew. Paul had told them so. That one day when they least expected it, Christ would come. And until then, we celebrate an active faith, a laborious love, and a patient hope. And with anticipation mingled with expectation, we say, one day, one day. And until then, Paul celebrated the fact that they had been found faithful. And my prayer is that we will to. Amen? Let's go have a good week. 
Make disciples. Baptize, teach. Do all that fun stuff. And in the middle of it, hug somebody before you leave and say, you know what? I just need to feel you near me, COVID or not.